So um, hello, everyone. So I have the uh, unenviable task of standing between you and lunch. So I'll try to somehow get through this very quickly, and then uh, let's all break for lunch. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the role of integration in um, API-driven world. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm touching a little bit about um, some of the aspects that Bhati also mentioned some of the aspects that Paul mentioned, but I'm going to go a little bit in depth into the integration layer and its role in, um, in the API-driven development and uh, how you want to uh, come up with a strategy for that. Um, but I'm going to start off with a little bit of a story, uh, the story of SuperCity. Um, a SuperCity is a, um, a supermarket chain. Uh, they have stores all around the country. Um, they've been uh, an established business and have been running uh, the business for a while now. However, lately they've um, experienced a different type of competition, not from the, the physical stores that they're uh, that they used to be competing with, but also with an online presence. Um, there are so many online stores that are coming up, like One Cart, Buy Groceries Online, and so on. Um, so they are now seeing some of their market share being lost to some of these online stores. Um, so they understand they have to do something pretty quickly. Um, so what they do is um, the management of this, uh, this organization get together, um, have some uh, strategy uh, around it, and they want to do something pretty quickly um, to somehow not to lose this market share. So they bring in um, a consultant, an IT consultant, who can um, assist with this uh, whole thing uh, and then ask them to make some recommendations. Um, so the IT consultant does a study, they come back and say, um, um, they, they propose uh, an API and an integration strategy for them. Um, now this API and integration strategy, um, they want to, uh, so they, that covers certain aspects. Um, first thing is because of the, the market share they are losing rapidly, they want to have a very quick time to market. Um, they have some critical systems they are using in their stores as well as centrally. Uh, they can't easily get rid of them, so they have to somehow reuse them. Um, and then all of this, as, as you would know, if you've, if you've done an IT project, uh, has to be done with the least amount of cost as well. Right? So this is the strategy that they, um, uh, the, the IT consultant proposes to them uh, that they should have. Um, as well as the, he also suggests that there has to be some sort of room uh, for future expansions of the business in, in uh, digital channels and so on as well. Right, so, um, so uh, if you look at what type of systems um, the SuperCity uh, has and how they want to achieve this, um, so the part of this strategy is to come up with, an, with a mobile app that their consumers can use to um, order groceries also have a website as a normal web store where you can do the same just as any other online store. Now, in order for them to do that, they have to somehow get these existing systems um, reachable by these applications, obviously, right? So this is where APIs come into the picture. Uh, now, this um, uh, the Super City has, say, for example, a POS system, um, uh, uh, order management system, uh, inventory, for example, uh, in their stores but they also do things like pricing updates and uh, reservations and all that centrally. So there are multiple systems that come into play. Um, they have to uh, think about in integrating together and then exposing out. So uh, what they try to do is first of all, expose some of these capabilities in these individual systems as APIs, and then enable that, um, you know, uh, enable those functionalities to be used by the mobile app and the, and the website. Um, so, how do they do that? Now, uh, obviously through API-driven uh, development. Um, so, I don't have to uh, convince you as to why APIs are required now. Um, there have been many talks now in the morning uh, on that topic, so I'm going to skip this slide. But the key enabler here for any um, digital transformation or digital enterprise is an API. So, that's how you start off your strategy anyway with. Um, Bhatia touched a little bit about the code first and API first design. So historically what we've done is we've um, developed the backend services, backend capabilities, and then once the API is done as a secondary thing, that 
it is only at that point the front end teams can now work on their uh, their website or the mobile client uh, so obviously there's you can see that there's sort of a waterfallish um, uh, approach here uh, and obviously that's going to take time so one thing that supercity has to do here is to go completely agile now how do we do that so um, if you use api first design as bhatia mentioned um, the key advantage here is that you don't wait until a backend system or a backend service is ready uh, for you to start um, developing anything that is possible. So, for example, if you do API first design, you start off with the APIs, you first come up with the interfaces that you want to expose out. And without waiting for the backend systems, you use some sort of mocks that create the behavior or mimic the behavior of the backend systems. Um, and this enables the front-end team as well as the back-end team to work in parallel, right? So this saves a lot of time. And the added advantage of this is you um, get to know how your API is going to be used in way advance, right? So, uh, with, so you, once, you, once you even have a mock in place and then expose it out, people start using it. And then you get, a, get to understand what type of um, access patterns, what sort of things do they do with this API. And, and with that knowledge in mind, you have now, um, you can easily do a better job in integrating with the backend, in, uh, backend services. And then maybe do some fine tuning by the time this, complete in, this integration is completed. So that's another advantage of doing API first design. Um, Bhatia also mentioned about API facade, so I'm going to go a little bit in depth uh, about the facade pattern here. So uh, one thing that I think all of you probably agree with me is um, having an API or deploying an API is not just about creating one and then just deploying it in a, in a runtime or a gateway. Um, there has to be some sort of integration logic that ties the API that's exposed outside with the systems that you're having uh, internally. Um, so that is where this API facade comes into play. So usually uh, the capability that you're exposing with an API might come, might go across multiple systems in the enterprise. So there has to be some sort of integration logic or plumbing that connects these uh, data as well as the capabilities in this, um, these systems. Um, and that, um, that complexity of um, uh, integrating these heterogeneous systems perhaps um, should not fall on the API gateway. The simple reason is the gateway has to be freed to handle all the incoming requests and just do the managed API portion of it, you know, enforcing security, uh, rate limiting, so on and so forth. It's, it's a good or a best practice that you um, separate out this integration logic and have it on its own uh, and have proper separation of concerns. So that also allows you to do changes to the API or the, uh, the integration logic without having a huge impact on each other. So you might have multiple systems in your organization and uh, some of them, if they are modern systems, are for sure to have some sort of an interface that exposes outside uh, some functionality or data, maybe through REST APIs, maybe through SOAP APIs or SOAP services. Um, so these are what we call as atomic services or system APIs. Um, however, um, the facade, for example, requires something else that, as I mentioned before, that goes through multiple of them. So you need something as a composite API layer that uses these system APIs in turn. So these, uh, this particular layer, you can see that they are actually doing some sort of an orchestration, so we can call them the orchestration APIs. So an orchestration API typically looks something like this. Um, so there can be a REST endpoint that it exposes out. When you call it, it might, for example, go and invoke a service that's outside your organization, get some data, um, enrich it, maybe add a few fields to it, and then maybe publish that into a queue that is picked, by, picked up by another system, um, and then maybe write something to a database, do a message transformation from, let's say, one message format to another, like XML to JSON, JSON to XML, and then eventually prepare a payload that is expected by another system, such as the CRM that you see here. So there's complex integration logic that uh, 
you have to, you generally do as part of the orchestration API. Um, so this is what actually goes into this API or what really happens within this API facade. So for this, you need some integration suit or a, a product that has all of these capabilities that you saw in the earlier slide, for example. So one such product, obviously, um, from WSO2 is the enterprise integrator. So let's go back to uh, the SuperCity story once again. So, um, so now, um, just to recap, they have a mobile app and a website that they want to um, use for uh, their online presence. They have some existing systems. As I mentioned earlier, it is uh, uh, inventory, stock control, POS, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and they have now exposed some of these out as APIs. Um, and then the mobile, through the apps, their consumers now can, for example, browse the, uh, the products that they have, get to know the price, reserve some of these products, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, there's still, if you, if you think about the online buying experience, there are still key features, key capabilities missing in this whole story, right? The people who, um, the people who buy eventually, so these, these APIs uh, 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 eventually, uh, they will have to pay for the, the, the goods that they buy and then it has to be delivered to them in some way. So they need uh, some sort of a payment system as well as a delivery system. So in, in this particular example, it is, uh, so the, the super city folks um, decide on using some of the services that are out there by other organizations, right? So again, integrating with some of those other organizations can again be done through APIs that they have exposed in a publicly. And this whole thing, as you see um, in, the, in the middle, is, is an orchestration API that handles all of this and then eventually exposes this to the mobile app and the, and the web app. So once again, um, the important thing is that you just, don't, um, you just don't expose this orchestrated API out just as it is, but you also have to think about the managing that API or, the, or exposing it as a managed API. So Paul mentioned about managed APIs, Bhatia covered it as well. Um, what we mean by a managed API is uh, not just the data or the capabilities that are exposed outside, but other non-functional aspects such as security, um, rate limiting, um, uh, differentiated services, Q, you know, quality of service, service level agreements, so on and so forth. Now the importance of the managed API here is if you, ex if you expose this as a managed API, this also opens up future business avenues for SuperCity. For example, they can now get their uh, partners to use some of these capabilities. Um, where, for example, they can uh, automatically reorder some of the goods that goes beyond, it goes, uh, you know, that they have to uh, reorder based on the quantity that they have in their stock. Um, or they can allow third party app developers to develop um, apps such as the mobile app they have. So they have other, and, and of course they can, uh, they can share their rev uh, the, the data that they have about consumer buying patterns. So that can be another business avenue for such a company as, as well. So uh, like that, having these managed APIs allows these organizations to um, explore new revenue streams in the future. Uh, so this is one example that I want to give you about um, how uh, API and integration works together and they are uh, equally important in, in, the, in the digital strategy or in the API driven world. Now, if you are also from an organization who's thinking about this, there are certain things that you have to do. Number one, you have to figure out what your digital assets are in the organization. So it could be a system that you're using right now. It can be data sources that you have in your organization. Um, it could be things like uh, SaaS applications that you're using um, and then um, data stored in multiple um, um, storage mechanisms like databases, spreadsheets, and so on. There could be applications that you're using that drive certain workflows or business processes across the organization. Uh, and then you might have legacy systems that um, work with proprietary protocols and data formats, like most of the banks still use all mainframes, right? So they are still uh, out there. Um, so they uh, have their own proprietary protocols and sometimes file-based techniques that you have to uh, integrate with. So first step 
is to identify what is there in your organization. And once you have done that, um, the next thing is to find uh, a product or a suit, a product suit that allows you to do these integrations as I mentioned before. Um, so some of the features that you want to look at in doing so or in finding a product is whether you can um, expose some of these things as APIs, can you do service hosting, does it allow you to do orchestrations and, uh, of the services and APIs, can you do things like message routing, um, can it do, um, uh, or does it allow you to do message transformations, um, does it support multiple types of transport because different systems might use different types of transport? Um, and then, you know, protocol switching and ability to process data, different formats and so on. And also, can it do things in parallel? So if you want to, for example, get some data and then um, based on what you have in that payload, uh, invoke a bunch of APIs in parallel, get that information, collate what you get and then expose that as, a, as another payload, this um, whatever product that you're going to uh, choose has to have that kind of features in built. So together with it, um, so now let's say for example you've chosen a product like for example WC2 Inter Enterprise Integrator that has some of these capabilities or all of them. Uh, the next thing is to think about an integration strategy just as an API strategy. Um, so uh, you go back to what you uh, found in the first step. What are your uh, the, what are the ecosystems that you have in your organization? Uh, are they systems that have uh, capabilities that you want to expose? Or are they systems that store data? Who are the custodians of these systems? Um, are there any duplications of data across multiple systems? So in which case, do you, um, do you want to make sure only one of those systems uh, is responsible for that? Um, and then remove the duplication from them. Um, and then, so, um, so you have to understand all of this and then bring them uh, as part of your integration strategy. And then once you have identified what systems and what capabilities you're going to um, expose out, the next step is to API enable those identified systems and then implement the integration logic. So this is where WS2 Enterprise Integrator can definitely help you. So um, in a nutshell, uh, the enterprise integration uh, greater is a is a hybrid integration platform. Um, if you ask me what it can do, my answer, a uh, one line answer, is it can connect anything to anything, right? So it has it has capabilities to uh, handle all sorts of um, things la such as web, excuse me, web APIs, uh, software as a service uh, applications that are on the web. Uh, connect to data services, message um, systems, messaging systems, um, proprietary protocols um, uh, or systems that require proprietary protocols and so on. So all, all of these capabilities are actually built into the enterprise integrator. Um, so what uh, enterprise integrator gives you is a single product that has all these capabilities such as um, uh, microservices, data integration, service integration, uh, business process modeling, uh, and then uh, messaging, analytics, tooling, and all of that. It can, as I s mentioned before, it can connect to various sources and systems that are out there, including file systems and proprietary and legacy systems. So this, uh, the, the, the product on its own has different profiles that you can use either on their own as, or as a combination. Um, so the, wide, the most widely used um, profile is the integrator profile. Uh, so you can think of this as a high performance, lightweight ESB um, that, um, um, that can do a lot of things such as what I mentioned earlier. Um, it, it supports a lot of these uh, standards and uh, WS standards uh, and web services standards that are out there. This is, uh, this, this and, and the, the, the way that you do it is uh, in its core, you have this open source project called the Apache Synapse project. So that's how this whole um, product started um, way back. Um, so it's still in its core has Apache Synapse. Um, so this is, this is basically the, the product that eBay, eBay uses as well as Paul mentioned in the morning. So other than the, the integration and the transports and the uh, different uh, mechanisms that it can handle, it also um, allows you to do things such as domain specific um, things such as it, ha it can connect to things like you know SAP, uh, and it understands protocols like FIX and HL7 and so on. 
Um, it's completely a uh, configuration driven, so you just have to code um, the it, in a language that is completely conf con configuration driven. Um, it is extensible, scalable, and if you know about the enterprise integration uh, patterns that are you know, uh, in found in this famous book, it covers all the hundred, all the hundred percent of those patterns. And if you go to um, uh, the the documentation of the product, you will see how to implement each of those patterns with enterprise integrator. Um, the other capability that it has is a data integration, uh, so it can. Um, access data in any um, relational or non-relational data sources, also in sources such as Excel sheets, uh, uh, spreadsheets, Google sheets, um, and so on. So uh, it has the capability to tap into those data sources and expose them pretty easily as an API or a service. Uh, but the cool thing about it is uh, it also allows you to combine data sources and then expose it as an API. So what you expose as, a, as an API eventually might be coming from completely two different data sources. And then it also has a business process profile. So using this, you can um, model business processes, workflows, uh, using standards such as BPMN, BPL, and human tasks. Um, if, you're, if, you're organize, if you're working with um, uh, business analysts, in your organization, you can actually get them to m draw the model using the, the visual notation on this product itself. And it, after that, you just have to integrate each of those um, you know, integration points uh, with backend services in that workflow. So it, it gives you that, um, that um, business front end so that anybody who understands BPEN notation or BPL notation can easily work with. Then we also have a product called Micro Integrator, um, which is, uh, 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 you can think of it as a lightweight integrator, uh, which is a, a lot more streamlined towards a cloud native development. So this has the same capabilities of the integrator profile, um, and you can, use to, you can use this to create composite services or even atomic services, um, and it, um, you can use the same EI tooling, which I'm gonna, talk about in the next couple of slides to create the same artifacts and then deploy in this. So you can, you can really de uh, develop it once and then uh, choose how, to, how you wanna deploy it. You can, the same artifacts can go into the normal integrator profile as well as the micro integrator profile. It gives you a faster boot up time, uh, it's a smaller distribution and it's, it's integrated, it integrates with cloud native uh, technology pretty, uh, pretty easily. So this is another uh, cool thing that you can do. Um, so this particular slide shows you um, a sample microservices deployment. The ones that you see, um, I don't know whether it's yellow, but the, uh, yeah, the, the services that are there are the core services or atomic services. Um, so the ones that are in orange are the composite services or the integration services that we are talking about. So this is where you can really leverage the micro integrator, um, where you um, develop the, the the orchestration between the atomic services and then deploy them as a composite service um, uh, on, on the micro integrator. Uh, so this is something really uh, you can use that product, uh, sorry, the, the, the component for um, if you have uh, such a deployment. So the EI also has a tooling, um, uh, the tooling that comes with it. Um, it is a drag and drop visual editor that you can use. Uh, through this, you can develop, deploy, test, debug, any integration sequence. Uh, it has a built-in micro integrator runtime so that you can deploy and then test it and debug it on, you know, easily pretty quickly. Um, you can also, the, the artifacts that you develop on this, you can export it uh, as a Docker image um, and then have it deployed easily with the micro integrator. Um, so if you, uh, so, so another cool thing about the tooling is that you don't have to necessarily develop everything from scratch. When you open up the, the, the editor, it comes with um, some, of, some widely used um, templates out of the box that you can easily use. So if you choose one of those templates, the, the integration sequences that you see there are already there for you. You just have to wire it up with whatever uh, services or whatever backend services that you have. So it comes with preloaded with a lot of these examples uh, or templates that you can readily use out of the box. 
Then it also ships with an analytics module, which gives you insights on how your um, integrations are running, or how your integrations are used. Um, so not only does it give you these insights, but another um, advantage of using these analytics is it also allows you to, um, let's say for example, dive in a little bit and then debug any integration problems that you have because the analytics can give you, for example, how much time it spends at each um, component in, the, in your integration uh, logic or integration sequence. Uh, and then give you some sort of in, in, uh, insights as to where some something might be wrong. So another cool feature is that you can use for um, you know debugging uh, uh, any integration problems. So if you already have procured, let's say, another analytics platform that you may be using already in in your organization, such as the Elk Stack or or using Prometheus, you can easily integrate uh, EI with that as well. Um, and this is also something that we support out of the box. Um, and you might obviously have in your organizations uh, CI CD pipelines in play. Um, it's quite easy to integrate these artifacts into those CI CD pipelines simply because the inter integration artifacts um, used by EI are completely file based. So they can easily be stored in a version control system um, and then integrated with a continuous um, integration server, uh, you know, a test suite and so on, and then um, you can automatically push some of these into different environments that you may have EI running in. So all that can easily be done using the um, using what you the capabilities that you get out of the box. Um, so let's look at how to solve some of these integration requirements using these features that are available in EI. Um, so a very common requirement is that. Um, there are, could be multiple systems in your organization that um, are compatible with standard protocols that are out there, such as the ones that are listed there, um, like web, uh, web uh, services and then messaging systems, file-based um, systems and so on. Um, so the, the enterprise integrator can, uh, out of the box, support all of these. So if you have a system that's, that supports some of these, it's pretty easy to integrate this. You don't have to do much because it has the capabilities built in. Um, and, and another thing is that the once you integrate with it, you can expose that as an API as well. So the difference between the APIs on Enterprise Integrator and the API Manager are uh, what you get on API Manager are managed APIs. So the APIs that you expose from here are not managed. Um, because the managing capability is, a, is, is a something that you have to treat on its own, just as Bhatia and, and Paul mentioned in their talks. Uh, and you might have um, systems uh, in-house that does not use any standard protocol. Um, it's still fine, because um, what you uh, can do is we have something called a connector store uh, that has close to, I think, 200, 250 connectors uh, already pre-built for you. Uh, all these connectors are available to you free of charge. You just have to go to apps. Uh, sorry, store.wsu.com uh, and then download these connectors and start using them. So each of these connectors, so we are one of the few, I think, or if maybe if not the only one that ships a Salesforce and a SAP connector free of charge. Um, so these things are there for you to use um, and that makes it quite easy for you to, um, it saves a lot of time as I mentioned before, um, if you're on a very tight time deadline. Um, you, it allows you to pretty easily integrate into some of these systems using those um, connectors that are available. Just assume that if you don't have um, a connector for the system that you want to integrate with, still all is not lost. The connector framework is also highly extensible, so you can use the connector framework to write a connector for the new system that you want to integrate with. All it has to have is some way of integrating using something like either uh, a, a standard protocol or a file-based mechanism or, or, or at a data layer. So as long as there is a way that um, we can use, it, you can write a custom connector for it using the, um, the extension framework and start using it. And, and another thing that we do is we keep on adding new connectors um, pretty much every quarter to this store. So every time a customer, we do a custom connector for, let's say, a customer, we might add that f to the connection so that everybody can use it. 
Um, then another aspect is obviously the file-based uh, systems that may be uh, still there. Like I mentioned, the mainframes and so on. Some of them are still using, uh, you know, the old technology of, um, um, you know, um, using files and so on. So with the enterprise integrator, something that you can do is you can pull, say, for example, a certain location, see whether there is a file, and then you can either pull it periodically on demand and then pick up that file and then process it. Uh, as part of the, the integration sequence. So this has um, schedulable tasks and so on, and also it supports uh, protocols such as FTP, uh, secure FTP, so on and so forth, um, that you can use for this. So this is one of the common things that most of we've seen some of our customers do for legacy systems, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then, of course, the, the database, uh, the, the data integration can be used to integrate with uh, anything that you have um, in-house. Uh, on, on, on data silos and then expose them as capabilities or um, services outside. Um, the product, as I mentioned, comes with a, a lot of extension points that you can, um, you can work with. Uh, it comes with standard mediators that are considered as building blocks of the integration sequences that you write. Um, it, you don't have to stop there. Um, it also gives you a, a script mediator that you can use JavaScript to write custom integration code if what we provide out of the box is not enough. Um, it also has something called a, a class mediator, which allows you to do the same thing in Java code. So it, this is also a extension points that a lot of our customers use. Whenever the standard capabilities are not enough, you can go and write your own thing using one of these methods. Um, connectors I spoke about, uh, API handlers, um, Custom tasks are other things that you can use as extension points. It also has inbound endpoints. What that means is different ways of for it to receive data uh, using different types of transport. You can do things like um, um, you know have custom XPath functions. It has a set of message builders and formatters that it ships with, but you don't have to be limited to that. You can write your own thing if it is not enough. Same applies for transports. Um, it it uh, supports out of the box. Uh, a large number of transports, um, and uh, some of them are um, enabled by default. Some of them are there in the configuration files with instructions on how you can easily um, enable them. Uh, and then, of course, um, things like custom message stores and processors can also be used as extension points. So these are different ways that you don't have that you can extend and not being limited to what we offer out of the box. So in conclusion, um, what I want to leave you with is that uh, API-driven development, or um, uh, if you're, if you're do even thinking about digital transformation, uh, as uh, APIs, is a very imp APIs are very important for that, but what really enables eventually for you to expose some of the capabilities and data are the integration projects. Um, so you have to have, so the integration part of it has to be also part of your API strategy. Just as you will have an API strategy, you also have to have an integration strategy. And you have to approach it with the same um, importance. Um, so you need to find a product that gives you all these capabilities for your project. Um, and one such product, obviously, is WC2 EI, Enterprise Integrator, that has all these capabilities. and. Um, that you can use for this purpose. So um, I, I hope you've got an understanding of how to successfully implement um, an API-driven integration uh, project with this talk. Thank you.